Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. And I want to thank the center for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm going to be sharing with you the latest science around the climate change. And, and um, most of this information comes from our own government agencies like NASA, NOAA, U.S. Department of Defense, and U.S. Geological Survey, among others. And also some research from some of our best institutions like MIT and Stanford. I'll also share some exciting news on the solution front to this man-made problem. So what motivated me to spend three days training in Atlanta to become a presenter? Well, it really all started when I moved out to Oregon. Let's see if we can make it work. So uh, basically what motivated me to spend three days of training is uh, I really fell in love with the outdoors when I moved out to Oregon and I took up all kinds of outdoor activities. And I found that being in the outdoors really nourished and rejuvenated me. I bet many of you feel the same way. But I do this not just for myself, but for the kids in my life. I want for them the same livable planet that I grew up in. And I'm sure many of you have children and grandchildren and want the very best for them too. So this image taken from the space station shows an important fact about climate change. It shows the true nature of our sky, that it's not some vast and limitless expanse that we think of when we walk outside and look up, but is actually a very thin shell protecting our planet. In fact, if you got in your car right now and drove for the next five to 10 minutes, you'd reach the outer edge of the atmosphere. And we are capable of changing its chemical composition. Just think back to the 1980s and the ozone hole caused by chlorofluorocarbons. Yeah, it does seem to work if I just click on the slide. So first, a real quick recap of um, climate change. So the sun's light energy passes through the atmosphere and strikes the earth, warming the earth. Some of that light energy escapes, but some is trapped and that's a good thing because it keeps our atmosphere at an ideal temperature for us. The basic problem is we're spewing millions and millions ton of CO2 into the atmosphere each and every day. We're treating our skies like an open sewer. This is in essence causing the atmosphere to thicken, trapping more of that heat energy and driving our temperatures up. Of course, the burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas the biggest contributor of greenhouse gases. But there's others like burning forests and our landfills. Here's the more than 140 year trend as a result of pollution being trapped. Global temperatures have risen dramatically. In fact, 19 of the hottest years ever measured occurred in roughly the past 20 years. And the hottest of all have been in the last five years. 2019 virtually tied 2016 for the hottest of all. Let's look though lo longer term at the last 800,000 years. This is a NOAA graph and it shows the volume of CO2 in our atmosphere. You can see it varies and here's the Earth's temperature over the same period of time. Over here on the far right is modern day temperature today and then it goes back in time 800,000 years. You can see that CO2 and temperature go up and down in lockstep with one another. Each of these dips, <clears throat> dips down low represents an ice age where at least a kilometer of ice would have been above our heads. The problem with spewing all this CO2 into the atmosphere is we've taken concentrations up to 415 parts per million today. So now we're already in unknown territory. Now, if the difference on the cold side is a kilometer of ice above our heads, what's gonna happen over the next 40 years as we continue down this path and take no action? We simply cannot let this happen. It could be catastrophic for humankind. Already, scientists are projecting that people in India may soon be unable to endure the heat there. And heat waves are occurring around the world, even in Alaska. The polar region, regions are actually heating up faster than the rest of the world. And the Union of Concerned Scientists tell us that <clears throat> if we can limit warming to two degrees Celsius, we're still gonna see five times as many days at 100 plus. 
here in central Virginia. This is the uh, Virginia's fifth district. Where does most of that heat go? Over 90% into our oceans, which raises sea levels because we know that from physics that warmer water expands. This of course makes storm surge worse. And ocean-based hurricanes, typhoons, and cyclones feed off this extra strong, extra warm water and become stronger, more destructive, and intensify more rapidly. Hurricane Maria that hit Puerto Rico two years ago and went from a category one to a five in just 24 hours. An example of how destructive hurricanes can be when they feed off warmer ocean waters, just look at Hurricane Harvey. It dumped five feet of rain in the Houston area, costing roughly $125 billion. That extra heat disrupts the water cycle. The warmer water causes more evaporation to occur over the oceans, which spreads over the land and falls in bigger precipitation events, rain bombs. Turns out that 2018 was the wettest year on record for Virginia. And some of you might remember back in May, on May 30th of that year, 10 inches of rain fell in the Ivy area, causing Ivy Creek to become a raging, raging flood waters. And two people died and there was severe road and bridge damage. Extreme downpours and record breaking snow events are getting more frequent around the world. Some of you might have caught just this past Saturday how Stanton had a flood in their downtown area after four inches of rain fell in two hours. Next up is a video that I'm going to show you of one of these one in 1,000 years downpours. This is the second time this has happened over a few short years. NASA has the capability to precisely measure the loss of ice, which contributes to sea level rise. In Greenland, ice is melting seven times faster than scientists ice. predicted. Another reason ice loss is important is melting, ice, melting unleashes ancient pathogens that been, have been long frozen in the ice. Viruses can stay ready to germinate in cold places, even in permafrost. On the eastern shore of Virginia, they've already begun to see the effects of sea level rise, including saltwater intrusion through the groundwater leading to barren farmlands. And this same sea level rise puts our national security at risk. The Norfolk area, which is home to our nation's densest collection of military facilities, including Naval Station Norfolk, has been seeing increased sunny day flooding. This is not a rain event, but a tidal event. People wonder how climate change causes both more precipitation events <clears throat> but also drought. It leads to both because precipitation patterns change and because, of course, warmer days dry out the land faster. Australia is in the midst of a three-year drought, which fueled their devastating fire season this last year, when 34 people were killed and thousands were left homeless. Reservoirs around the world are shrinking due to the extra heat, contributing to water shortages. Large fires correspond closely with the years of higher temperature. Of course, vegetation dries out more quickly in hotter temperatures, but also there are more lightning strikes in warmer weather, increasing the chance of sparking a wildfire. In the heart of the Canadian tar sands regions, large parts of Fort McMurray were destroyed due to a wildfire. 100,000 people had to be evacuated. This is a similar scene we've seen in California. Who's paying close attention to all these weather catastrophes? Of course, the insurance industry. Heat waves, droughts, fires, floods, and severe storms are all increasing in frequency. 
In fact, the last two years, the world has incurred $650 billion in economic losses due to, due to weather extremes. And our own Department of Defense has long warned of refugee crises, pandemic diseases, and water and food shortages due to climate change, all of which lead to conflicts, more conflicts around the world. Climate change is a threat multiplier. And back to availability of water. Everything and everybody needs more water and hotter temperatures. But of course, evaporation rates increase with higher temperatures. Heat stress makes crops more vulnerable to pests and decreases crop yields. For every day, the temperature is over 84 degrees Fahrenheit. Corn yields decrease 0.7%. In fact, for each one degree Celsius of warming, these four crops decrease their yields and they make up two thirds of the world's calories. Climate change makes most medical conditions worse. Infectious diseases, heat-related illnesses, air pollution, and waterborne diseases, to name a few, are all influenced by the changing climate and not in our favor. Here, students are taking an exam while breathing toxic smog. Lung conditions are a health effect of burning fossil fuels, increasing asthma in particular. Power plants, industrial facilities, highways, and hazardous waste sites are most often situated in minority communities, exposing them to air pollution and, and with it, low birth weight, weights, preterm babies, higher rates of asthma, heart and brain diseases, and decreased lung function. Climate change is also a racial justice issue. So these asterisks are where these diseases are commonly found. Their potential range expands poleward as regions get warmer and warmer. Of course, mosquitoes spread in a warmer, wetter world and bring with them things like Zika, dengue, and yellow fever. And did you know that in warmer temperatures, viruses actually incubate faster, breed more, and transmit for longer periods of time? the health impacts will affect millions around the world and most often hits the poor, those who can't afford mosquito netting and doctor's visits. The UN now reports up to 1 million species are at risk of extinction due to climate change and other factors such as habitat loss. We're already seeing species in decline, marine vertebrates down half in the last half century. All of these threats plus more lead the World Economic Forum to consider climate change the number one threat to our global economy. But there is hope on the horizon because there, are, there is good news on solutions at hand. Look at these projections for wind energy. There's been an exponential growth in the amount of wind being built around the world. Wind is now the cheapest form of electricity in much of the world. And think about it, Dominion Energy has already announced plans to build 220 wind turbines off the coast of Virginia. It would be the nation's largest wind installation. And there's plenty of wind to fuel the world economy. How'd you like to have free electricity? In Texas, there's so much ex excess wind energy, they give it away from 9 p.m. to 6 a.m. because it costs them more to shut down the tur wind turbines than to give it away for free. And Scotland is producing twice as much en energy as they need from wind. Solar has had an even more impressive growth than wind. It's really hit it out of the park. This graph shows worldwide growth in solar since the 1980s. In developing countries, they're leapfrogging over the old technology and installing solar where they've long gone with no electricity whatsoever. 
This graph shows the decline in the cost of solar in the US. It's pretty dramatic. And I wonder how many of you know that Fort Hood in Texas is powered by sun and wind. It's because it saves us taxpayers millions of dollars. India took a U-turn after the Paris Climate Agreement. They're on track to exceed their commitments under the agreement. An incredible 225 gigawatts of electricity two years from now with plans for 500 gigawatts a decade from now. Look how quickly coal is being phased out of India. And I want you to think for a moment, how long do you think it might take for the sun to shine to power the entire global economy for a full year? Yeah, just one hour. If we can harvest a fraction of that solar energy, we can make a lot of progress towards climate change. And we can help local economies because the Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us that in the last five years, solar installer jobs exceeded average job growth sixfold. And the second fastest growing job right now in the US is wind turbine technician. Since 2009, global investments in renewables began to exceed investments in fossil fuels, and the gap keeps growing. The economic calculus has shifted and will fuel even more change. And look at this timeline. The year before the Paris Climate Summit, electricity from renewables were cheaper than fossil fuels in only 1% of the world. Last year, just five years later, renewables were cheapest form of electricity in two-thirds of the world. And four years from now, they will provide the cheapest form of new electricity. That's how quickly it's happening. Battery storage, of course, is essential for the green energy revolution because we need a way to store the wind and sun energy when the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing. This is a $1 trillion industry emerging over the next 20 years. Improvements in battery storage capacity is making things like the early closing of this gas-fired power plant possible. And electric vehicle car sales are taking off. The transportation sector is such a huge source of CO2. We must tackle this area to prevent climate disaster. Soon, battery electric cars will be cheaper than gasoline-powered ones. And this is because the powertrain is the biggest cost in a car. These 16 nations around the world have passed laws setting deadlines to phase out gasoline and diesel vehicles. And these phase outs are proceeding quickly. Another positive trend, half the buses of the world will be electric just five years from now. Regenerative and organic farming is a means for sequestering CO2. In other words, pulling the CO2 back out of the atmosphere and, and locking it up in the earth. And both of these are on the rise. Big food companies like General Mill are already paying their farmers to switch to regenerative agricultural practices. The Paris Climate Agreement is a very positive sign the world is waking up to climate change. China and India are on track to overachieve their commitments that they made there. And other good news, these proposed coal-fired power plants were defeated due to either public opposition or competition or both. All of these plants have been retired. These have all had their retirements announced. They've all been canceled. This is a dramatic new trend. And nearly 200 global companies have committed to using 100% renewable energy. This will in turn put pressure on their subcontractors to do the same. And it's all happening because us consumers are saying to them, hey, we don't want to do business with a company that's not trying to fight the climate crisis. Our own governor has issued an executive order setting Virginia on the path towards 100% renewable electric grid. And this last General Assembly session saw a large number of legislative initiatives which will combat climate change. Our own city and county have both adopted greenhouse gas emission reduction goals. And you can help by getting involved by pressuring them to move quickly on meeting their goals and holding them accountable. 
One reason these things are happening is because of these giant demonstrations occurring around the world pre-COVID. And the youth climate strike movement has really taken off. Back in September, there were nearly 800 people on the downtown mall at our local youth climate strike. Citizens Climate Lobby is laser focused on passing federal legislation to put a fee on carbon. This fee would be collected at the source and 100% of it would be given back to households as dividends. This is a bipartisan bill. It's revenue neutral, creates jobs, and benefits low-income people because they would actually get back more than they'd spend on the extra cost of fossil fuels. In closing, this is what's at stake, our world. We must change and we can change. We've seen the solutions that are at hand. I, I think we will change. All of us can affect this change. I challenge you to go out and talk to everyone you know, friends, family, neighbors, coworkers, anybody and everybody, because we know that talking one-on-one -on -one to people is the most effective thing any of us can do. Here's a list of other things you could um, possibly tackle, but it's not a complete list by any means. And I wanna thank you all for your time today, and I'm happy now to answer questions. Wow, Joan, that's quite a list. Um, <laughs> thank you so much. If you want to click stop share so we can uh, okay, we'll see do. everybody. There we go. All right. And um, let's see. If you have a question, you can use the chat or you can just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask Joan a question. And I want to apologize for those technical issues. I really don't know what happened. That's fine. We got through them and, um, you know, it made me feel closer to you. What can I say? No. <laughs> Anybody questions or comments? Let's see. I just want to say those are amazing slides that you you showed. Uh, really, it's impressive how much, how far we've gone already, and uh, you know, there's there's hope. There really is. There really is. We just have to keep the pedal to the metal because there's so much happening, especially about renewables. Yeah, I am agree with you, Bruce, for sure. Julie, did you want to say something? I just wondered what a, th a smart thermostat was. Um, we have one. It, um, we set the times when it will cut up and uh, cut on and cut off or, you know, set the temperature. Like we have it uh, in the wintertime, you know, come on and at a certain time and uh, heat back up. Um, and at 11 o'clock at night, we have it turned back off, you know, and have the temperature set at a much higher temp, you know, like 79. What is it? Forget what we keep it at in the winter, but, um, you know, so that it's, we don't have to think about it, you know, and it saves, uh, on energy because you don't run that risk of like walking out the door and having forgot about it, especially when if you go away for just a night. Well, that's the same as a programmable thermostat. Yes, right? yes, it's the same, yes. Oh, okay. And you know, something like uh, power down your computer at night and shut off power strips to turn off phantom loads. Um, that's, you know, something you, I've finally gotten the habit of doing. I don't do it every night, but I do remember a lot of nights, so. Someone asked um, if you'd be willing to share your slideshow with us that we could review it later. I don't know if that's proprietary information. Unfortunately, the... it is. You know, um, I think if you've recorded it, it's okay, but I can't directly share it. Okay, so that's good information. So we have recorded, we are recording this and um, we will upload it onto our um, YouTube website. And the way you'll find out where that is, you just go onto our website and there's a big YouTube icon. You can just click on that, it'll take you to the center at Belvedere YouTube. Um, usually takes us a little while to get it up there. And if you want me to notify you when it's there, please shoot me an email. I'll put my email in the chat. 
Carolyn at the center Seville spill.org and um, thank you for that I Carolyn, appreciate you yeah could I ask Joan a question absolutely hey Joan you know that list was really helpful I thought is that proprietary too no and I actually have it as a printout but of course in these COVID times I'm not presenting in person so maybe well, it would be helpful to share just that one slide just so people if they're interested, could review it because there's so Why much. Why don't I send that to Carolyn? Absolutely. And she can add it to the, with her, what she's going to upload. I think that would be a, a super idea. Thanks. Sure. Yeah. So if anybody wants it, just email me and, and Joan, if you send it to me, I'll just shoot it to you. So, yeah. I have a question for you, Joan, if it's okay. Um, do you, what was the most stunning fact that you came across in your three days of training? What, what really went whoa to you on either side? What we're doing that's great, what we're doing that's not so great. It was pretty amazing, I have to say. It was like uh, when, when Al Gore does the presentation for us, he actually does um, roughly five to 600 slides in this vein so you can only imagine you're just like constantly overwhelmed while he's given these slides um so the information just keeps pouring in and pouring in and um i think you know really the ending you know where you get into the um positives of the things that are happening you know that's when you're really like oh thank goodness you know things are you know really starting to happen and um he, he continually updates these slideshows so that they're very current. And I've seen, even since I went, which would have been a year ago this past spring, um, that there's been already been remarkable progress on renewables um, that have shown up in his slides. So that's inc very encouraging. Can I Thank make you. a comment? The list that you had of all the countries and how far they've gotten did not have the United States on it. And I think that's something you might want to emphasize. <laughs> that, you know, there's a lot going on in the world, but we seem to be an island of not doing enough. Yeah. Something yeah. for people to be aware of and maybe try and change that projector, that trajectory. Good point. Good point. Um, I have a quick question about um, solar energy. So I, um, we've always been really proud that we have solar panels on our roof, but I did read an article recently about the side effects of creating solar panels. Um, do you have any information about whether there's a way to make that process a little more eco-friendly? Um, I do know that there's a lot of, um, people out there trying to research that right now, because yes, that means mining certain uh, minerals that uh, could devastate certain parts of the world. Um, so there, uh, not only is there research there, but there's research and uh, they're beginning to be able to find ways to recycle those batteries or the uh, parts better, the minerals okay. that they've gotten. So, you know, I, I feel like that's being addressed uh, mm -hmm. where they'll get within a short period of time. I don't know, but. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Great. Anyone else questions or comments? Well, I have just one more quick, Thing. It's sort of a personal thing, so I'll be quick, but I'm actually signed up to take the climate leader training that you took um, Yay. coming up at the end of the month. They're doing it all online now. So if you don't mind, if I can maybe get the senior center to pass on your address, uh, your email address or phone number, I'd love to just ask some questions about it before I start. Yes, yes, yes. I'd love to talk to you. Great. Thank you. You're going to love it. I'm excited. Just shoot me an email. I will give you Joan's email. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. 
You know, I imagine, um, Joan, that some people um, who see this or hear this, and again, I don't take any sides or whatever, um, may think it's, um, uh, you know, not accurate or whatever. Can you speak to the, the accuracy of the slides? I mean, you showed a lot of information. Like, how does this, how well, does this? Um, it's interesting because um, before um, CRP, Climate Reality Project, came out with their own uh, presentation to go online, uh, because, you know, there's rights associated mm. with all these images. They have bought the rights, et cetera, so they're not necessarily usable online. But before that happened, I was researching the same information and trying to get uh, images that I could use. And I was, I was surprised. Everything was like, oh, yeah, oh, here's this. This is it's very similar to what they have on here. And, you know, so... Um, but most of it does come from our own government agencies. I mean, especially NOAA, uh, National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration. Um, you can find a lot there. Great, that's helpful, thank you. Anybody else, any comments or questions for Joan? I thought it was a very effective presentation and I appreciate all the suggestions for how we might get involved if we so choose. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, Joan, we appreciate your time, your expertise, and uh, again, just uh, reiterate, if you want the list, Joan will send that to me and I can forward it to you, that last slide. Mm -hmm. uh, we will, we did our recording this, so that will be up on our website eventually, up on our YouTube website. And if you want to know when that is, aside from just checking all the time, you can also ask me to email you. I'll put you in my little folder that says when it gets published, send you an email. And uh, thank you again. All right. You're welcome. Thank you all. All right.